Good morning and uh, welcome to Ordinary Life. I'm so glad that there are people in the room. It's so much easier, better, funner to talk when there are people in the room, and I'm glad you're here. I think that we probably have a number of people who are not here today because they're home watching Conspire with Father Richard Orr, which is his last Conspire event ever. And uh, if you registered for Conspire, which I did, I found out through my son that the content of Conspire is going to be available for the next year. Now, whether you can go back and get it after the fact, I think they'll let us know sometime after this week. But I got to spend quite a bit of time with Jim Finley yesterday, and that was, that was wonderful. I think he's, he's one of great. the great people of our time. And if you happen to tune in early today to see the cartoons that were up, I'm going to give Wayne Herbert credit for like 90% of those. He sends me these really great, I think they're great. They are good. They're good cartoons. I, yeah. They're better than the ones I select. Go ahead. I, and say I am it. not going to make an opinion on that one. Go ahead and say it. So <laughs> thank you all for being here, and thank Tim and John and Olivia and William and um, I don't see what. Oh, there he is. And uh, Richard Wingfield and Wayne and Callista for doing all they do to make this happen. So. Um, do we have any announcements? Uh, do we? Um, well, we've been told that the coffee and the tea for our class will be set up downstairs in the, uh, as you come in, um, but we still see that there's something here, so I'm really not sure what to tell you about that. I'm preparing you that that might happen, that I think in an effort to have less disposable cups and things like that, the church is trying to consolidate where the resources go. So just know that that uh, yeah, I don't. I don't know. I. I, I really don't. I'm just. Uh, I'm the messenger. <laughs> oh, sorry. I laughed. Oh, I've been told I laugh too loud, and it's hard to edit out. <laughs> I'm. I'm gonna work really hard to not laugh. Okay, we won't laugh. Do not make any faces, Wayne. <laughs> um, I first became aware that I laughed too loud from my husband a couple years ago, and a friend confirmed it. And then when I hear myself on the podcast, I'm like, they're right. <laughs> I laugh too loud. I have to edit myself out, too. Anyhow, um, the other announcement is a repeat of where funds have gone over the last couple, where they are going over the next couple of weeks is toward, don't do it, Roddy. <laughs> He's also laughing at me to make sure that I don't laugh. <laughs> Right? Um, it, the, that part of our funds are going to Interfaith Ministries to help resettle Afghan refugees as they come to Houston. Um, and another little bit is going to Haitian folks who are still in crisis, and we've seen the, the pictures on the border, too. Um, and then thirdly, to Boynton Church to help kickstart their after-school music program. And I think those are the only announcements I have. We have. If you would like to donate to Ordinary Life, there's all kinds of buttons on the website that will teach you how, and you just have to put Ordinary Life in the memo, and it will come to us, and it's m greatly appreciated. So, thank you. So, can I do this? Do this. You want me to do that? Yeah. But I can't hold it and do it, right? Oh, I don't know. We'll see. So, sacred mystery or God, whatever word you want to use, is right here. And at an effort toward non duality, we pray to and from sacred mystery these words. We offer ourselves to you to build with us and do with us what you please. And relieve us from bondage to the ego so that we may better grow into our true selves. And no matter who you are, no matter where you are on your spiritual journey, you are welcome here. We talked to two dear friends yesterday who uh, attend Ordinary Life every week, but not on Sunday. <laughs> That's funny. You know you can do that. 
that uh, Tim um, records this and uploads it to the Ordinary Life website, usually by Tuesdays. And so you can go and see all the slides, you can get the text of the talk, uh, and, and you could listen to it. So no matter when you watch it, no matter where you are, I'm glad that you're here. But if um, no matter where you are, you're welcome here. And you just be aware that... We had uh, the wrong huh? slideshow up. That's the wrong slideshow. Yep. So who put that up? I, it wasn't me. <laughs> just kidding. <laughs> so we do it. Um, Give us a second. You just keep talking. I'll work on it. Uh, that's okay. I could go. <laughs> so you can sort that out, right? Mm -hmm. Yep. Okay. So um, our goal in these times together is that we see ourselves as part of who God is and that we see sacred mystery as part of who we are, both. So when I was first in the university, I had a professor who walked into class one day, and I want to interrupt the sentence by saying we were not an unruly class. We were boisterous. We were full of ourselves. <laughs> and so one day he walked into class, and he took a textbook, and he slammed it down on the desk as hard as he could, and he said, I demand pandemonium. <laughs> and you could have heard a pin drop. Because it was his way of showing us that sometimes it was not so much what you said as the way that you said it. That man's name was Lane Bowell. And Lane uh, taught at the university where I was before I came to Texas, and he is the person who called me aside to his office one day and said, you need to get out of here. You need to go to a place where you can study what you're really interested in. And I said, and what would that be? And he said, well, based on the work that I've seen you do, you're interested in religion and psychology, and there are places where you can go to study that. And I credit Lane Boutwell mm -hmm. with being the man who put me on the path that got me to where I am. He is the guy uh, who said to us in class one day, now, I want you to remember, don't ever repeat yourself when you're giving a speech or a lecture or a presentation, don't ever repeat yourself for emphasis. Somebody Understand? <laughs> Don't repeat yourself for emphasis. And he didn't, he didn't realize how funny he was. I thought it was very funny. <laughs> so um, I, I'm going to repeat some things today, including what I just said, because I've, I've done that before in here. I want to repeat something about Jesus and questions because we're dealing with two questions at the beginning of the Gospel of John today. And this is something I first heard Richard Rohr say, although now I put it in my, my own words. So, um, we're there. <laughs> I don't know who first came up with this and what version or translation of the Bible they use, but someone has gone to the trouble of counting up all the questions Jesus is asked. In the various stories, uh, tellings of his stories, and, and what they determine is that Jesus is asked 138 questions. He answers three of them. Now, <clears throat> how satisfying is that <laughs> for a spiritual teacher, really? He should run for office. He should run for office. <laughs> <laughs> so somebody will tell, ask a question and he'll tell a parable, which we're still trying to figure out most of which, what they mean. Or he would ask a question and people just out and out ignore him. Or he would ignore them. Or he would ask a question in return. Or he would tell them that's the wrong question. Jesus himself, oh, ask, oh, okay, I keep getting this wrong. Can I go? There you go. Jesus, that's it. Jesus himself asked um, 307 questions. 
And I'm wondering if we could follow his example here. Because those who appear to be Jesus' most strident followers in our time have an answer for everything. The church has become a very efficient answering machine. So the one thing that Jesus is consistent about is his insistence on the goodness and reliability of God. And as far as his teaching is concerned, he could not be appointed to teach in an evangelical seminary today. And yet believing in him has become, for many who call themselves Christians, the cornerstone of what it means to be a Christian. So, here you go. The next time you have a conversation with a religious fundamentalist, though I don't think having an actual conversation with such a person is really possible, ask them if they know the three questions that Jesus answered. Now, I know all of you do. So, um, do you? Did, did you before you read this? Um, I probably couldn't have recalled them, like one, two, and three. So when I first heard this, yeah. I, I had no memory of what, what they were. So uh, I will tell, you, tell them to you. One of them was from John's telling of the story, which we will get to much later, the rate we're going. It may be sometime in the next millennium. We're going word by word by word here. <laughs> so Pilate asked Jesus, so you, th- so you think you're our king? And uh, Jesus says, yes, I am a king. I was born for this. But if you go look at what is actual in the passage in John where this is, Jesus redefines what king and kingship and kingdom mean. So it's really a very relativistic kind of answer. So the second time is when Jesus' disciples went to him and asked him to teach them how to pray. Lord, teach us to pray like John taught his disciples to pray. And he said to them, this is how you pray. And then there are two different versions of the Lord's Prayer in the New Testament, but that's another thing. I don't think this is a question. I think this is a request that he met. The third one is this. To disconcert him, one of the Pharisees put to him a question. Master, which is the greatest commandment of the law? And Jesus said, you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your soul. And the second is like unto it, you must love your neighbor as yourself. This is for sure the only question Jesus directly answered in the New Testament. Now, the passage from John that we're going to look at today contains two questions. One, Jesus asked, and the other is asked by his first two disciples, at least according to the passage we're using, or my experience is being that we're used by Hmm. in this uh, text. So here's the passage from John. The next day, John, again, was standing with two of his disciples, and as he watched Jesus walk by, he exclaimed, Look, here is the Lamb of God. The two disciples heard him say this, and they followed Jesus. When Jesus turned and saw them following, he said to them, What are you looking for? They said to him, Rabbi which means teacher, where are you staying? He said to them, come and see. And they came and saw where he was staying, and they remained with him that day. It was about 4 o'clock in the afternoon. One of the two who heard John speak and followed him was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. He first found his brother Simon and said to him, we have found the Messiah, which simply means the anointed one. He brought Simon to Jesus, who looked at him and said, You are Simon, son of John. You are called Cephas, which is translated Peter. Now, keeping in mind that John is writing a parable about the life of Jesus, as the Johannine community had come to understand it, it's a parable. What are we to understand? What sense can we make of this part of the parable? And what relevance does it have for us in the shaping of our own faith and spiritual life? What do we want? What do we really want? And is what we want what we truly need? 
The one other thing I want to repeat today is a quote from perhaps the greatest living Jesus scholar alive today, and that's John Dominic Crossan. This is one of my favorite quotes from Crossan. Crossan, you know him, you know, he's a little Irish guy and just funny as all get out anyway. Crossan says, my point once again is not that those ancient people told literal stories and we're now smart enough to take them symbolically, but that they told them symbolically and we're now dumb enough to take them literally. Somebody's um, heretic alarm just went off. Because of something I said? <laughs> Is that like you've talked enough and shut up now? And well, it's my turn anyway. Let, let Holly take over. Okay. Um, so there, there are so many interesting things that happen in these few lines in John. And I mean, gosh, I, I promise we're not actually going to go word by word and line by line. And we could be doing this for the next five years. But um, you know, last, last week I spent... A whole hour on one line. <laughs> we'll move faster than that um, from time to time. But first, in these lines, I want to talk about who is there. We have John the Baptist and the two disciples, one of whom was Andrew, and the other is unnamed. And scholars think that the unnamed disciple, uh, Sanford says, that it could have probably been the gospel writer himself, that he was there but not there. Keep in mind, he's writing almost 100 years post-Jesus. Um, so he's a presence, not a physical being. So in some way, he represents like all of our consciousness to be there in that story. It makes me think of how the Renaissance painters, I don't know if you, any of you had to study art history in your degree, I did, um, <laughs> had to paint, most of the Renaissance painters were commissioned by the church, by a patron, by uh, the Pope, and the Pope had to approve everything. And very often, um, the Renaissance painters would put a representation of themselves in the scene as a kind of way to say, I did this. And sometimes as a way to sort of push against the Pope. Often the painter is the one looking out towards the audience as opposed to being in the painted scene. Here's an example. Um, well, we'll just use my fingers. This is the last judgment in the Sistine Chapel, and you can see where the little circle is. That's Michelangelo's droopy, kind of grotesque face uh, on The Last Judgment, looking out toward the viewer. Similarly, the writer of John, as I said, was there, but not present. So a fourth person comes in, Andrew's brother, Simon Peter, who I can imagine Andrew running back home and being like, oh my gosh, he's here. This is before text messaging. He couldn't just quickly go, come over here. I met this guy. But he grabs his brother to come and see. Simon becomes a really important figure. Well, that's not what this is about. But his arrival gives us an opportunity to talk about the name that Jesus eventually gives him. Bill will go into this later. But Cephas means the rock. I want us to take a moment to consider the significance of embodying a true name, who we really are, a name that embodies the true self. We've talked about language and meaning as our kind of technology. It's like a human superpower. There's power in naming things. When we say what something is or what something is like, we've given it a defined form. Uh, we've constrained it sometimes. You think about the things that were said about you that weren't so nice in your lifetime. Those things get internalized. Hopefully the things that are said about you that are kind and nice and affirming also get internalized. Both things are true. Both perceptions of self are shaped by words. Language is used about us, creates or reinforces beliefs about the self. So Jesus says to Peter, you are the rock. There's also that wrestler, actor, the rock, right? I don't know if Peter was that huge, but maybe. Um, <laughs> the writers of John are very deliberate and very specific about people and places that they use in the storytelling about Jesus. And I want to say that in this gospel, nothing is without very intentional meaning. The woman at the well, that's very intentional. It may not be true, but it's intentional, which can make for, as we go through this, a really long slog. Let's stop at this word for just a minute. Yeah. 
Um, <laughs> but naming or the specificity of language is not unique to Jesus or the gospel writers. There's a tradition among many Native American tribes that um, one is given an individual name. So you might be given your sort of born name, but you might also be given the individual name that you grow into. You might remember the super popular film Dances with Wolves. That guy was given a kind of Indian name. I, I don't know how many actual white people were given Indian names, but that it's, it's an example of how people were named. Um, my family jokingly referred to me as Stands with a Fist. She was also in the movie. She was the really opinionated, willful one. <laughs> so that was me for a while after that movie came out. I don't know, you know, so based on the way early colonists treated the Native Americans, though I'm gonna guess we mostly got names like Ravages with a Stick. One article that I read this week said, um, re overall referred to as they with the hairy chest. <laughs> that, that was a common one for white colonists. I think that's funny. <laughs> the names given to Native Americans are meant to reveal something about their character or their temperament. They might be given, again, a name at birth, but their true names are earned. There's a, a, a tribe of people called the Sami people in northern Scandinavia. They have a traditional form of song called the, the joik or the yoik. I think, I think in, if we look at the word, we pronounce it joik, but it's yoik. <laughs> and they evoke or depict a person or place through melody and song. So someone might enter the room and uh, in a traditional setting, they might start singing that person into the room. And that person's melody is known. No two people have the same joik. So we might sing Bill into the room by saying something about how you tell great jokes and can perform miracles. <laughs> and then, yeah. Um, anyway, sometimes the, the yoik is no words at all, just an instrumental or kind of melodic chant, almost like um, a meditative chant. The Sami have no written language. It's a symbolic language. But they can yoik a deceased ancestor, call a living person to them with a song. So if I wanted to call Roddy over here, right, <laughs> I might sing you to me. Or you can yoik your kiddo, for example, to give him good self-esteem so that he feels good about himself. And as you grow into that yourself, kind of becoming, evolving, and growing up, your song can change. So your song might be one thing as a kiddo and might be another thing as you grow up. The point is that it's supposed to recall someone to their true nature. They're, they're meant to be positive. They're meant to be the, the songs that tell us who we are. And as the Sami culture got Christianized, yoiking was suppressed because it was called magic. And it seemed interesting to me to consider that Jesus was kind of a magician in this way. He named people's true names. Speaking of music, um, John Sanford quotes Fritz Kunkel in his book, The Mystical Christianities, as calling John's gospel a great spiritual symphony and felt that it was written for those who had kind of been initiated into the way and were ready for a deeper understanding of it. And so this in gospel is really a, a, dive, a dive into our, our ability to be psychologically aware of our own experience with these stories. Um, I'm not trying to suggest that if you don't relate to the Gospel of John that you're somehow at a lower level of consciousness. consciousness. I'm not saying that at all. I'm simply saying that our understanding of John can evolve as our consciousness does. When I was a kid, I heard it literally. As a grown up, I can hear it metaphorically. As I, when I'm your age, who knows? I'll just see visions. <laughs> and dinosaurs. And dinosaurs, that's right. <laughs> so what I understand now about it is very different than what I think I'll understand 20 years from now. So the invitation here as we get into the Gospel of John, as we name it, is to come along and see for yourself. <coughs> Jesus was the master of intriguing invitations. I think that's the, the what, what his parables serve, is this kind of come and see. That's what we issue you here. So the question, um, what do you want, where do you live, are really two brilliant questions. Um, you know that in the other narratives, when Jesus calls disciples, he calls them from fishing. And it's an incredibly important metaphor even there because people are called 
away from their primary way of making money, and they're called out of their belonging system because the men that he called, now there were women too, but they got written out of the story, they're called away from their father, away from the belonging system. And it had both a very um, it profound economic impact and a cultural impact for these men to leave. And when they did leave, Jesus said to them, I will make you fishers of men, <laughs> fishers of people. And um, one of my professors in seminary said that a better translation of that would have been, I will show you what to want. Hmm. Or, even better, I will fix your wanter. <laughs> I wish I'd thought of that. That's a brilliant, yeah. brilliant thing on the part. The professor was Carl Almarney, by the way. So you and I live in a culture where we are almost constantly bombarded with messages telling us what we need to want, what we must have in order to be happy. And even if we didn't listen to these messages, we still all want to be happy. We want to be safe. We want a good life for our family and loved ones. We don't want difficulties. We don't want problems. We want to be safe and secure from all alarms. However, if we have eyes to see, it is clear that the way of our world, the way of our culture, is not keeping us safe. Now, I used to, when I would return to Tennessee driving to see my parents, I would drive through um, Collarville, Tennessee, outside of Memphis. So this week, I paid attention, particular attention, when there was another mass shooting at the Kroger store in Collarville, Tennessee. Mm. So I have been checking from time to time um, a trustworthy source on such shootings. And I know you, Wayne, have too. And I'm going to show Wayne's headlines sometime, if that's okay in here, about that. Wayne's been keeping a scrapbook of all the headlines of shootings in mm -hmm. the Houston area that show up in the Houston paper. It's astounding. 45 in 10 days. 45 in Houston oh, in 10 days. Nice. So, um, so far, according to my trusted source, a total of 14,516 people have died from gun violence in this country since the beginning of the year. There have been 498 mass shootings since January 1 till last week. Hmm. Oh, that is not the abundant life. According to John, the way into abundant life is an, an abundant living is to step into and live in the world into which Jesus is inviting us. Come and see. Now, I personally think that the, uh, the question put on the lips of these two first two disciples is because they were tongue-tied and they couldn't think of a good answer. <laughs> and they, so they said, where do you live? But his response was, why don't you come and see? That's a parable. It's a metaphor. Why don't you come and see where I live? So Jesus is inviting us and, um, into that world and not into the world that our deaf, dumb, and blind egos have created. So the, the first step in this process is a willingness to be a disciple, a willingness to be a learner, a willingness to be a follower. And in John, the Gospel of John, this begins when John the Baptist, which we're going to talk about next week, points to two of his disciples and says, here he is. Mm -hmm. And they follow. Now, in Sanford's book on John, Sanford points out that John uses four different words to express the English word to see. And each has its own distinct meaning, and Sanford says that the story will mean more to us since it's going to appear again and again and again in the gospel if we uh, know something of each of these words. Uh, 
So when John says, behold the Lamb of God, the meaning is, let this man impress himself upon you. That's the meaning of see. A second uh, verb for the meaning to see is the kind of seeing that would occur if you were in a dark room and someone turned on the light and then said, can you see now? Can you see? And a third verb for seeing is in this passage when it says, Jesus turned around and saw them and said, what do you want? And the word used implies that Jesus did not merely see them, but he saw them for what they were. And a fourth verb, which is used when Jesus is described as seeing Peter. And, and Sandford says a good translation of this would be to stare at. Uh, don't let the size of Sanford's book put you off. It's a very readable book. Yeah, the chapters are quite short. It, it's just got... Yeah. So much rich material in it. So John draws the attention of his two, two of his disciples to Jesus because John was pointing out the importance of what was being seen, and they followed Jesus. Jesus sees them in such a way that lets him know and lets us know that he knows that he knows of their significance, which leads him to ask, what do you want? Or more accurately, what do you seek? And the difference between wanting and seeking here is the difference between being led by the ego and demonstrating a genuine spiritual hunger. As I said, these disciples are tongue-tied. Mm. They can't decide what to, how, how do you say what you want if you're new at this game. You don't know, maybe. So they say, where do you live? And he says, come and see. And one of these two is, is, as Holly said, is identified as Andrew, who goes gets his brother Cephas, and says to him, we have found the Messiah. And when he comes to Jesus, Jesus sees him in such a way that he sees his character, and so he gives Cephas a new name. You're the rock. The point is that Jesus saw into the character of Peter in such a way that he saw um, the firm, rock-like character that was Peter. Now, as we see, as we will see going forward, Peter has to have his ego dissolved before this inner character is going to uh, emerge. And, and please don't, let's just turn you off, but I need this. I need to keep being reminded this is a parable. It's not history. This is a, this is a story. And I think this story is a parable that is true for us as it is true for those who first heard it. We have to have a hunger and a desire to move to ever-increasing depths in the spiritual journey. Remember, our, our, our work is to increase, to deal with the increasing capacity of the heart to experience and express the love of the sacred. The ongoing increasing capacity of the heart so we have to be willing to live in the presence of the sacred, both to be initiated and taught. In the, in the next disciples call, Peter and Andrew, Jesus seems to know Nathaniel even before meeting him. And so the Jesus that we meet in John has these incredible capacities. And if you read John at the level where we've been used to hearing it, these First verses seem so full of supernatural stuff that it just seems improbable to us, very unlikely to us. But when we begin to explore the nature of the unconscious, this kind of language begins to make sense. So what is the meaning of discipleship? You know you're going to have a test over this. <laughs> Notes. I'm not here. <laughs> After you go, you know what I mean. <laughs> oh, gosh. We're just preparing. <clears throat> Multiple choice? Multiple choice. No, I don't think so. So the primary purpose of religious story, as well as our learning as much as possible, as much as possible about our own psychological makeup, has to do with the evolution of consciousness. And we're going to spend all of next Sunday 
talking about the evolution of consciousness because John the Baptist is the symbol of the evolution of consciousness. He must increase, I must decrease. The self must grow, the ego must get out of the way. But uh, right now I want to say that one way consciousness can evolve is by putting ourselves into the story. Not just read it, not just know about it, but to read ourselves into it, to know the music of Beethoven. You don't simply read his biography and look at a piece of sheet music. You immerse yourself in a symphony. So we immerse ourselves into the music. I want to quote Sanford again. We will examine the experiences that the disciples undergo that are described in the fourth gospel as paradigms of the experiences that we also may have to undergo in our own spiritual and psychological development. The story of the call of the disciples by Jesus is the first such story. Now, though this notion is foreign to most of us, it was not foreign in the day of uh, Jesus, and I'm talking about the importance of being initiated into a new way of thinking, being an identity. One of the values, and I didn't put this in the notes, but one of the values of the Mankind Project and the New Warrior Training is it puts men through an initiation process. Mm -hmm. Women don't need this so much in our culture as men do. Um, the initiation process for most men in American culture is just getting your driver's license, uh, your first sexual experience, maybe getting drunk for the first time, whatever it is, you get initiated into what it means to be a man. But that's not what real initiation means. And so in the world in which Jesus lived, there were all of these mystery religions. Okay, you've heard that phrase before. They were all around. They were Greek, they were Roman. But the mystery religions, the way that people got initiated into mystery religions is that they got initiated into the birth, the life, the death, and the resurrection of the God of the mystery religion. So birth, life, death, resurrection is not new in Christianity. It existed in the mystery religions of the day. And what you find the gospel writers, and especially John, doing is taking from these mystery religions their message and putting it into the context of, of the Jesus story. So it was by mystical participation in the life and being of the God who died and rose again that the initiate would take part in a new life. So I want to give you a reading or interpretation of this first part of John, the calling of the disciples, and this is it. In order to move into a new or higher level of spiritual insight, we must be ready to receive it. These disciples are hungry for new insight. The meaning of the metaphor of leaving John and going to Jesus is that they were no longer satisfied with being in the John camp. And John knew that, that's not literal, pointed to another level of development, and they left and went. Now, you have to be dissatisfied with what's going on in order to be able to leave and move towards something new. So sometimes uh, our currently held positions have to go away. And for some people, this is a real, real crisis. I mentioned watching part of the Conspire event yesterday on, um, and they're doing such a wonderful job with technology about Conspire. And I saw uh, Brian McLaren. I don't know mm -hmm. if you know much about Brian McLaren. You, you know? I do know. Brian McLaren is a very interesting man in that he is now one of the leading voices in progressive Christianity today. When Brian McLaren started his journey, he was a rigid fundamentalist. And he, I've watched him over the years make this progressive transition from being a fundamentalist into being this really progressive voice for uh, progressive Christianity in, in our time. And so those transitions do take place. They can happen. But I think they don't come by trying to persuade somebody of them, mm -hmm. convince somebody, argue somebody in, into their presence. Posting on Facebook probably won't work. But if the person 
her or himself has a sense of dissatisfaction where they move from one level to another. Now you ha have to, you know, you can't fly from the first level of development to the 12th. You can't get in a plane and just go there. You have to go through successive stages. And very often when you leave one level and go to another, you go through this happy place called the dark night of the soul. <laughs> The disciples are on the way. The teacher appears. When the disciples are ready, the teacher appears. Jesus appears. They're ready. But as we shall see, the way they go is going to involve more crises and difficulties before this story is over. It uh, occurs to me that the wisdom of the Sami naming people throughout different stages of their life may also coincide with those different levels of yeah, consciousness, that, right? And so this, this openness to being renamed, this openness to change, that we are fluid is, I think, an important one to hold here. We don't have to stay the same as we were yesterday. We aren't the same as we were yesterday. <clears throat> so this line, what do you want, is translated in two other ways. And in the message, Eugene Peterson's retranslation of the Bible is, what are you after? <laughs> the way that phrase kind of makes me think that Jesus was a little annoyed. Like, what are you doing here? <laughs> um, not Maybe neither wanting nor prepared for Andrew and the unnamed disciple to be there with him. It reminds me, one time I found myself in the same location as one of my childhood baseball heroes, Jeff Bagwell. <laughs> and I just sort of stood there and looked at him like, oh, my God. And he finally just looked at me and was like, Hi. <laughs> What, what are you after? <laughs> you know, <laughs> so that's how I hear that line. Of course, I mumbled something like, I hope your shoulder gets better and walked away. He was perfectly friendly. Um, anyways, it seems like these disciples just wanted to soak up Jesus, just wanted to soak up his, this goodness, and he was gracious enough to go, come along. The other translation from the King James Version is, what do you seek? This is more of a soul-searching question. What is your deepest longing? It's um, an ego self-alignment, where the self inhabits the ego rather than, than the ego being in charge. And it's an integration kind of question. What do you seek? Are you following your true name? Are you following your true self? When they say, we hear you are the Messiah, Jesus doesn't confirm or deny this. He allows that, what uh, would be called in psychology, that transference for the time being and just invites them to come with him to find their guide within. Or what the mystic poet Kabir describes as the secret sound, the real sound, which is inside you. So when we get at our deepest longing, it's not always easy. And that deepest longing looks different at 20 than it does at 40, than it does at 60. I mean, these things change. Though the two fields are distinct, in this case, both religious and psychological questions are concerned with, as we've been saying, the evolution of consciousness. God is not equated with the unconsciousness, or nor is Jesus, but they are both vehicles through which the unconscious can be known. Calling forth our deepest longing may, like the Sami song, change from life stage to life stage to life stage. We are in continual self-discovery. It's limitless, and it's endlessly creative. What we want and what we need may not always be in alignment, but I do believe that Jesus was asking that question, not a like, what do you want? You want some chocolate? You know, the, <laughs> the longing behind wanting chocolate is nourishment. He's getting at the longing. Marshall Rosenberg, the late psychologist who formed or formalized the strategy of nonviolent communication, believed that there is a universal set of human needs. And unlike Maslow, he thought that one need is not necessarily higher than the other, that our need for meaning can exist right along our need for basic needs, basic nourishment. So they, he says they break down in the following categories. This is the needs wheel, don't try to read all the small print. But the basic categories are connection, physical well-being, honesty, play, peace, autonomy, and meaning. The reason I say that they are non-hierarchical is because we can be in prison, not have necessarily physical freedom, but still have a strong need for meaning and purpose. 
In fact, Rosenberg's theory emerged with his work with prisoners. He worked with um, violent criminals in the California jail to help them come to their own sense of feelings and needs and how to name the, what was going on inside. We have all these needs within, and these categories are meant to sustain and enrich life. And at different times in our life, one need may be more up than another. Um, our needs change even throughout the day. You know, this morning I had a need for some pick-me-up. <laughs> Tonight I may have a need for something that's going to wind me down, right? Uh, I'm kidding, but they, our needs are not static. We are always at choice about which needs to fulfill at any given moment. And the beautiful thing that Jesus does is to provide space for that choice to be made. He makes the invitation. Why don't you come along and see for yourself? The strategies we use, so I may, might make art or write poetry to help find uh, or nourish my need for creativity and meaning. These strategies help us meet our needs. The disciples may have needs for meaning and connection, and their strategy is to follow Jesus and to be with him where he lives. What they get along the way will be different for each one of them. The specifics will look different, but the seeking is the same. How do we learn to discern when we are answering that still small voice inside versus the demands of the ego or self-interest? How can we possibly get quiet enough in this loud, loud world to just listen? Some call this God's will. What is God's will for my life? I always think of that article you sent me. And I think it amounts to like, just be quiet. Love your neighbor with all your heart. That's what we were issued to do. See that point above in Bill's talking earlier. But others could call this purpose or vocation. Essentially, it is that which you can't not do. The writer and theologian, Frederick Buchner, am I saying his last name right? Buchner. Okay, I said, okay. Says that by and large, a good rule for finding out is this. The kind of work God usually calls you to is the kind of work that A, you need most to do, and that B, the world needs most to have done. The place God calls you to is the place where your deep gladness and the world's hunger meet. Our purpose does not have to be this huge public display of leadership or a best-selling novel or the next run for Congress. No one even has to know your name if you're doing the work that you are called to do, the work that gets you up in the morning. This is like the essential question that Viktor Frankl arrives at in his surviving a concentration camp, which is what does life expect from you? Not what do you expect from life, but what is life pulling forth from you? Okay, but still, how do we, how do we know? I think it's neither wise nor responsible for us to tell you the what. Here's what you need to do. But, <laughs> right? <laughs> what if I'm wrong? I've, but, <laughs> but I've got a growing list of people I want to say that to, though. I'm a... <laughs> <laughs> See Bill's journal after class. He may have your name in it. Um, <laughs> but maybe what we can help illuminate is the how. How do we get there? I guess we could call this life's kind of poetic justice in that we very rarely receive a direct answer when we ask this question. But if we're open to coming along and seeing for ourselves, we will find the answers. They're everywhere. What we seek can feel elusive at times, hard to catch, just out of reach like that hummingbird that never fully slows down. I think if it slowed down and stopped, we might actually give up the seeking. But the idea of the seeking keeps drawing us forth, and the seeking is hope. Who can, um, come on, you guys know what I'm going to say, right? Emily Dickinson's poem. Hope is the thing with feathers that perches in the soul and sings the tune without the words and never stops at all. It pulls us forth. A teacher of mine advising me about my dissertation said that it should, I should write it about the question that keeps me up at night. And I also think that in the end, it's the answers or the seeking the answers that get me up in the morning. That's where it is. So uh, what's God's will for your life? 
<laughs> Come on, folks. It's the Lord. only question he answered. <laughs> See above notes. <laughs> Footnotes. Star, In Christian asterisk. lingo, it is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, and the second is likened to it, you love your neighbor as yourself. Or the way that I would put it, if you want to use a non-religious language and use spiritual language, once you have dealt with the survival issues, the purpose of life is to grow, is to continue to grow. To and it, Wait, pause. I just said you can deal with the survival issues and seek meaning at the same time. And seek meaning at the same time. <laughs> so I'm not going to contradict her. But we, we, we can put ourselves on a path of continuous growth in those values that I keep stressing over and over again, which are peace, love, joy, patience, and humility. Those five things. And you, you can do that and be a Buddhist or a Hindu or a Christian or a Jew or whatever, but those are, those are what we're doing and what we're going. So I want to keep you also in mind that this Gospel of John, like the other Gospels, but the Gospel of John in particular, is the product of a community. It's a community that was having a really difficult time, no longer being accepted in the synagogue. They couldn't be Jewish Christians in the way that they thought they were going to be able to. They were now beginning to experience persecution. They were having a rough go of it, and they would meet, and they would talk about stories that they had heard, because very few eyewitnesses at that time were around, about this man named Jesus, and how in his presence they had ex experienced the sacred, and now they had this incredible joy, love for one another, forgiveness, and hope for the future, their resurrected, their resurrected life. And I don't know what they did. We don't have any video recordings of it. But I can imagine them sitting around and saying, hey, do you remember when Jesus said blah, blah, blah? And the other one said, yeah, and now. You know what I think that means now? And they would keep evolving the story until um, eventually somebody went to CVS and got some paper and wrote it down. CVS. So, huh? <laughs> CVS, yeah. <laughs> So there are multiple authors of John. The scholars agree that there are multiple scholars of John. What they don't agree on is how many. Mm -hmm. That um, four primary ones, maybe. We'll get into that. I was going to show you what a page from John in the Greek New Testament look, look like. Something emerged from a community of people who were like these first disciples. They were between one way of understanding and had not yet quite reached another at the beginning. And I, I'm, I'm coming more and more to see us this way. I mean, those of us who are part of the United Methodist Church are moving toward a denominational structure that will no longer be united. There's going to be the formation, I don't know when, at some time in the future, of a new denomination called the Global Methodist Church. And if you remember when Dr. Jim Bankson was here in dialogue with me, he said this Global Methodist Church he didn't care for because it's be referred to as the GMC, and he's always been a Ford guy. <laughs> oh, man. Do you all just sit and tell jokes together? <laughs> <laughs> so it, we, we're definitely going to be in the minority. That's what's happening in this culture. Um, there's a great editorial in the Washington Post this morning that Josh sent me about mm -hmm. the constitutional crisis we're in. Well, it makes me think the same about the Constitution. We need to go back and see what its relevance is for today. I wonder if there should be a law that we should review and revise the Constitution every 100 years. <laughs> Or 50, or 20, I don't know. <laughs> so I've been reading Ilya Delio's newest book release. Um, it it um, contains some of newest writings. It's called The Hours of the Universe. And uh, the data is in, according to this woman who stood right here and gave us a wonderful presentation one weekend a few years ago, and many of us just fell absolutely in love with her. But if we keep doing as a nation what we're doing, our future is bleak. You've heard about the measurement of energy called the carbon footprint. Mm -hmm. right. 
Elia says that if the entire world were to live as we do in the United States, it would take six additional planets to sustain us. I remember a few years ago when I myself became firmly convinced of the dangers of climate change or global warming. There had been yet some other disaster. I don't remember what it was. And I asked a scientist friend of mine who is also a deeply spiritual person, what is going to happen to the earth? Now, what I meant was, what's going to happen to humans? Because mm -hmm. that's an ego, self-oriented way of thinking, right? What's going to happen to me? And um, he responded just very clear-headedly, and he said, the earth is going to be fine. It's us that are doomed. The earth is going to be like a wet dog coming in from a rain shower. It's just going to shake itself and get rid of all the vermin and proceed. That image has stayed with me. So I was listening to Holly and I was thinking, you know, one of the things that we started talking about a good while ago was that we need to embrace the end of two things. We need to embrace the end of cosmological dualism and we need to embrace the end of individual salvation. And neither one of those things has helped us. And then I grew up hearing, change the hearts of people and you will automatically change society. Mm -hmm. That's horse feathers. Mm -hmm. I have another word for that, but I can't use it publicly. <laughs> Here's one of my heroes. I don't think I've ever talked about him in mm -hmm. here. This is George McLeod. Any of you know George McLeod? You know George McLeod. George McLeod was the founder of the Iona community mm -hmm. off the coast of Scotland, a group of... Uh, Christian monastics who really preserved Christianity in that part of the world, Celtic Christianity that is, was referred to. George McLeod had an encounter with this guy, <laughs> Billy Graham. This was after World War II, the dropping of two atomic bombs, the nuclear arsenals were being built up among the Superpowers and McLeod had an encounter with Billy Graham in which he said, Billy, we have a huge problem on our hands. What are you doing about the bomb? And Graham responded, convert people, George, and the bomb will take care of itself. Mm -hmm. To which McLeod replied, Billy, you and I have been converted. What are you doing about the bomb? <laughs> <laughs> Now, the part of John that we're looking at today is an invitation into a whole new way of looking and seeing and experiencing and expressing the love that transforms us, transforms the world, transforms our relationship, transforms the cosmos. You get it in three chapters. God so loved the cosmos. That's the word in Greek. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So before this transformation works its magic on us, we tend to think that God is out there. And after this transformation, we know mm -hmm. experientially God is not out there. God's here. Mm -hmm. God's there. God's here. We, we don't look at reality anymore. We look from reality. This is the meaning of the Eckhart quote that both Holly and I use over and over and over again. The eye with which we see God is the same eye with which God sees us. Now, moving that from here to here, mm. a journey of 18 inches is the trip we're trying to make. Mm -hmm. And then we can be back in what Orrin Caulfield, or, or, Owen Warfield called Barfield, Barfield, I mean, called the original participation. We're not learning about the mystery. We're participating in the mystery, and that changes everything about how we see our lives. By the way, this is why we are beginning uh, every class now with this prayer that we offer ourselves to sacred mystery to build with us and do with us as you please. Relieve us from bondage to the ego, so that we may better grow into our true selves. And just thinking spontaneously about a question that was posed to me in a group I was part of yesterday 
uh, Bernice, you'll, you might remember, what does it mean? What does transformation mean? What does it mean to be transformed? And what does it mean to be transformative? And that's a question I've been thinking about for the last 24 hours. But So this is a perfect moment to draw us back to the Gospel of Thomas, don't you think? I've heard of that. <laughs> Seeking is exactly in line with that, my favorite saying of all in there. If you bring forth what is within you, what you bring forth will save you. If you do not bring forth what is within you, what you do not bring forth will destroy you. This has a lot of potential to stress us out. What if I'm not doing it right? Ah, what am I doing wrong? You're fine. You're here. You're seeking. You're present. And we can practice our attunement to that still, small voice by listening, paying attention to life, as well as to the deep quiet within. I might have just suggested a daily spiritual practice. Mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> Having young children for me is for whom the world is still kind of a marvel. They're still experiencing first. That, that fades every passing year. They're all they're 12, 11, and 10. But it's one of the best gifts for helping me see again. Both words, see and seek, relate to vision. One is more inward and one is more outward. What I see is outward. What I seek is inward. But both are in kind of syncopation with each other. They inform each other. What we see in the outside world stirs something in our inner world. And quoting Kunkel again, before we discuss Beethoven, we should have been stirred by his music. To allow for that stirring is part of the process of seeking. The disciples were moved enough by this radical teacher named Jesus to drop everything and go and see for themselves. They had no idea what they would find. So I'll close with this classic and touching poem by Mary Oliver, about whom it is written that she helped us to stay amazed. She's like a patron saint of seeking, of seeking and of seeing. Poem, by the way, I love this, comes from the Greek poesis, which is the activity of bringing something into being that did not exist before. Here's the poem. Who made the world? Who made the swan and the black bear? Who made the grasshopper? The grasshopper, I mean, the one who has flung herself out of the grass, the one who is eating sugar out of my hand, who is moving her jaws back and forth instead of up and down, who is gazing around with her enormous and complicated eyes. Now she lifts her pale forearm, forearms and thoroughly washes her face. Now she snaps her wings open and floats away. I don't know exactly what a prayer is. I do know how to pay attention, how to fall down into the grass, how to kneel down in the grass, how to be idle and blessed, how to stroll through the fields, which is what I have been doing all day. Tell me, what else should I have done? Doesn't everything die at last and always too soon? Tell me, what is it you plan to do with your one wild and precious life? That's beautiful. So, can I uh, put an addendum here? Mm -hmm. Transformation is simply um, doing what we're going to talk about next Sunday, the evolution of consciousness. You're dreaming, and you have a dream, and then during the night you have another dream. They may be very different dreams, but you're still asleep. Transformation of consciousness is following the admonition of, admonition of Jesus who says, wake up. Hmm. No matter where you go this week, no matter what happens, remember this, you carry a precious cargo, so watch your step, and we will see you here next Sunday. <laughs>